Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to Be Ways Twice. I am, I think some of you already know, I'm Shweta Bandapani. I am the community builder at Be Ways Twice. Be Ways Twice tries to uh, fill in the knowledge gap that's available, that's there in the field of waste sanitization, san sanitation, as well as uh, climate change by and large. And we try to do webinars. We've been doing webinars since 2013. And currently, we do two webinars a month with uh, diverse moderators from all over the world who try to cover topics from all over the world. And uh, today we have Sarah Ottaway, who's a sustainability and social value lead at Suez Recycling and Recovery UK. She's moderating the panel on normalizing reuse and repair in UK. Sarah has uh, put together a panel with three others. She's invited Elaine Brown, Chief Executive Officer at the Edinburgh Remakery. We have Andrew Ferguson, co-founder at Refashion, and Zakia KG, who's a founder at Swap It Up. Uh, we have received your questions that you put in along with your registration. They've been passed out to Sarah, who is going to include them in the conversation that she's having with the panelists today. But there is still the Q&A section. Please do uh, put in your questions there. Uh, Sarah will pick them up as and when it seems relevant to the conversation. And uh, stay alert through our webinar today. We have some polls because the panelists want to know your thoughts on uh, what's going to happen as well. So yes, over to you, Sarah. Fantastic. Thank you, Sweta. Hello, everyone. And uh, thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Um, we're going to be delving into this really key unlocker in our evolution of our economy to a far more circular one. Um, and the momentum is already building. There's reports all over the place about all various things that are going on to really drive progress in terms of reuse and repair. For example, France are introducing uh, their repairab repairability. Gosh, I've got to say that word. Labels from uh, from last month for key electronic items, and they're going to become durability labels in 2024. We've got major clothing labels uh, launching rental services, and we are also seeing reports around how millennial and Gen Z generations are telling us that they're really embracing swapping and reselling unwanted items rather than buying new. And that brings me to why I'm just so excited about today's session because it's a passion of mine, both personally and professionally, and because I'm joined by this incredible panel um, who are going to share uh, some of their insights and their experiences with us and be part of this discussion about how we take reuse into a far more normalised part of our daily decision making. So the format for today's session is I'm going to give each of our panelists about five minutes to tell you a little bit more about the world that they operate in, what they do, the fantastic stuff the organisations that they're involved in do every day in terms of reuse and repair. And then we're going to have all those questions from yourselves to really open up the debate with the odd poll question uh, coming through as well. So like Sweater said, don't, don't get distracted by the dog or the kids or whatever it is, because they will be popping up. Um, so first of all, I'm going to be handing over the floor to Elaine. Elaine uh, is the Chief Executive Officer for the Edinburgh Remakery. So Elaine, the floor is yours. Hello everybody. Um, I'm Elaine Brown. I'm the Chief Executive of Edinburgh Remakery. The Edinburgh Remakery is a social enterprise with charitable status. We're based in the beautiful city of Edinburgh, in a district of Edinburgh called Leith. Leith is an area of multiple deprivation. Um, and we've been there since uh, 2016, um, and we specialise in all things repair and reuse. Um, so before COVID, we specialised in refurbishing furniture um, and obviously selling it at low cost and teaching people the skills around repairing the furniture. We uh, provided workshops to teach people skills in textile repair and woodwork, and we also did electronic um, waste in the form of refurbishing IT. Um, during COVID, we've pivoted our model and now this is our new model going forward, which is our e-waste and education hub. So we're really concentrating on the e-waste, the electronic waste, which is one of the, the largest growing uh, sources of waste stream um, and um, an area where a lot of people struggle to know how to, to comply with legislation, what to do with it. Um, and what are the skills you need to repair it. So we've really concentrated on teaching the skills required to refurbish, um, and we've got IT apprentices uh, training them up. We're selling it at low cost to help people who are facing digital um, isolation and poverty. Um, and we're also doing a huge amount of gifting. So um, gifting to those who are really facing hardship and when we're pivoting to homeschooling, et cetera. So, um, and our education hub is really focusing on the skills that are going to be required for a circular economy. 
Um, so we're trying to fill that skills gap now by encouraging young people to learn the skills that are repair and reuse, know about the circular economy. Uh, but for me, my, my passion is also to show young people in particular that the third sector in repair and reuse is a vibrant career opportunity and one that they should get involved in because they can really make a difference to the planet. So that's us. Fantastic. Thank you, Elaine. And one of the questions that's come through from the audience in advance of today's session that I wanted to, to pop to you now yeah. is around where you think the, um, with electronic devices, obviously, you know, being really core cool to what you guys do, because they're becoming increasingly difficult to repair at the moment, um, what do you think the roles of repair by an individual versus repair by uh, a specialist repairer are? And do they, are they, are they both components or is one more important than the other when we're talking about normalising and using repair? Um, well, I think they both have their role. So if it's the case of you as an individual who've got a piece of IT equipment and it goes a little bit astray, rather than press the buy new button, um, it's really important for them for people to know how they could possibly repair it themselves. So we, we want to give people those basic skills to help them do that if it stops them having to buy something new uh, for a piece of kit that could be uh, easily refurbished by themselves. But equally, because we're taking it as a business model um, and companies are donating their old IT, they want the reassurance that it's done by professionals, that there's proper data wipe um, and there's proper um, waste transfer notices and everything. So if you're doing it from a business perspective, I think it's important that you've got the credibility and the credentials behind you to make sure that you're following environmental legislation and data protection. Um, and also the, the items that you are then giving to other people are safe um, and secure. Um, but equally, we want the individual themselves when they're sitting and their computer goes a bit adrift or their screen breaks, that they've got the skills that can that can repair that themselves. So both are important, uh, but just different ways of doing it. Okay. That's great. Thanks, Elaine. Um, and thank you. So uh, let's pass on to our second panellist. Uh, as uh, as I mentioned, Andrew Ferguson is a co-founder and chief executive of Refashion, of which my uh, outfit today has come from, from the store. So it's, this is it in action to that. Um, so, uh, Andrew, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And yeah, liking the outfit, it looks great. Um, yeah, I'm a co-founder of Refashion. We're a um, second-hand um, clothes e-commerce website that um, operates on two levels. One for sustainability, to keep clothes in the loop and, and, and to be reused. And the other thing that we do with the, uh, with the sale of the clothes is that we give a portion of the sale price to charity. So we both keep clothes out of our landfill and raise money for good causes. So it's kind of like a win-win for our customers. Um, and so most, uh, nearly all of the clothes on our website are donated to us by our customers. Um, and we've tried to make this uh, super easy for them. So you can order a, bag, a donation bag online through our website. We send it out to you for free. You declutter your wardrobe at your leisure. And then when you're ready uh, and you filled your bag, you can post post your clothes back to us for, for free. So we're kind of bringing some of that, um, what that kind of the, the charity sector would have done in the, it, on the high street, we're bringing that to the online world to kind of match our, our customers' experience because most of our customers are Gen Z or millennial. And so they're kind of used to this more digital online behavior. And we're just so, sort of echoing that. Um, and so, yeah, we work with a, charity partner called the Reeves Foundation. So all the money raised goes to the, the Reeves Foundation and they're aligned with our values. They're a um, charity that has a specific focus, a UK charity that has a specific focus on fashion sustainability. And so it's, it's totally aligned with our kind of mission and our mission is to um, bring fashion sustainability to the mainstream because we feel that sort of sustainable fashion is sold to the consumer as a premium product. You know, most of it is, you know, like fancy designer labels or kind of quite very high, it's a high barrier for particularly our consumers to enter. And so we want to kind of democratize that and make it easy for um, people to be part of that circular um, economy without, you know, breaking the bank. And so, yeah, we're kind of like, 
echoing a lot of the um, usability and functionality that probably the, <laughs> the fast fashion industry have done in terms of our user experience. So we're echoing that, but we're delivering a wholesome, sustainable product. So we have free returns, we have search by brand name, you can filter by size and by price, all that kind of great functionality that these uh, mobile first e-commerce sites have, we have on our pre-loved site. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're trying to, we, we're learning from the best, but we're delivering something that's sustainable. Um, and kind of like our kind of mission, this kind of like drive for trying to uh, achieve zero waste kind of has led us to do an other initiatives beyond just reselling secondhand clothes and keeping them in use. We also try to, um, uh, we create RAG, which a lot of um, donated um, businesses do. RAG is the clothes that you can't sell due to a broken zip or a rip or a stain and, and lots of charities themselves create RAG. And it's a big business for them. They sell it by the ton and, you know, it's shipped wherever it's shipped. We kind of feel a little, little bit uncomfortable about that. So we try and keep all our rag in the UK and we, we bag it up into two kilo bag um, uh, packages and we get it into the hands of fashion students, upcyclers, thrifters, people that are wanting to repair and, and remake uh, clothes. So that's kind of like something that we're quite proud of. And we've recently um, opened a section of our site that now sells those uh, um, upcycled clothes. So we've got this beautiful kind of um, circular model going where our waste is not wasted and it's turned into something unique and beautiful. And then it's, we, we, we resell it on behalf of the upcycler that has, has created that um, design. So yeah, we're really proud of of what, we, what we're doing there and that's that's refashion <laughs> fantastic thank you andrew um and i've got to admit i need to go and have a look at that part of the website in terms of the upcycling um areas because uh, i've seen that i've got i've got the email that's dropped into my inbox i need to go and have a good look i'm excited about that also the best pair of jeans i've ever bought is from refashion just if anyone is looking for jeans as someone who always struggles it is great for that <laughs> um so, uh, Andrew, before I get too excited about and tell everyone more about my wardrobe, as I'm sure they've heard enough of that now, in terms of your uh, questions for you, so mm. customer profile, your target audience, who, mm. who is kind of in your, your scope of vision when you're looking at or when you've developed refashion and who you're targeting now in terms of your marketing? Has that changed over the last 12 months at all? Uh, I think we always had a suspicion that it would be the, a younger consumer that would uh, resonate with our our, our brand and, our, and our, our business. I suppose, you know, and, and we specifically targeted that by making, bringing it online, I suppose. And our kind of hunches were confirmed. And yeah, our sweet spot is a, what's called the millennial sort of 24 to 34. However, they're kind of like equally kind of bookended by Gen Z, which is the young, younger consumer. And, and what we call the kind of um, young at heart mum, who's probably, you know, like in her forties, that they're, they're really um, a, a strong customer of ours as well. So, uh, but yeah, our sweet spot is, is is millennial, and and it hasn't changed. It's kind of what we thought it would be, and it and it's being confirmed in 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 the sales and and, and engagement. Fantastic. And um, questions that are coming in for the audience because they are coming in thick and fast. Um, mm -hmm. What makes refashion different from other sites like um, thrift and spock and the other? different apps there are out there what sets you apart yeah so i yeah so, th so those other um sites are generally peer-to-peer -peer, and um there's an effort i suppose in terms of um somebody having to upload they have to do it all themselves um there are other um sites similar to ours um but are probably in the more premium um price point because obviously the margins are a lot higher like we unashamedly um, operate in the mainstream uh, because we don't think anybody else is, you know it does set us apart we kind of like high street fashion and upwards we do get donated some amazing designer items but very few it's all kind of like zara caramillon uh, you know like mango all that kind of stuff and we, as long as it's in good condition 
we can sell it and and it just proves to you to, to this point that you know like this what was perceived potentially as disposable fashion isn't you can find a market for it and you can keep that clothes in, in use and i suppose when we're operating at that level for somebody who um might want to photograph that put it on depop or spark and then sort out all the kind of the issues that they have with it the margins that they're going to get aren't going to be great and so for them the fact that it's going to a sustainable charity you know like we're kind of taking away that um layer of convenience for them potentially if it was a burberry trench coat they probably would put it on spock or <laughs> and, and probably make more money but when it's a mango t-shirt or something give it to refashion and we can and we can make use of it and we can sell it and we can generate money for charity so so we kind of like operating in this mainstream um area is actually kind of like our usp with you great lovely thank you andrew um, i'm now going to pass on to my uh, third panelist of the day so zakia kaji is the founder and chief executive of the people-led fashion exchange program swap it up uh zakia the joy the uh, floor is yours hi thank you sarah um hello everyone my name is zakia kaji and i'm the 18 year old founder of swap it up which essentially is a clothing exchange that runs in schools and it allows students in schools uh, secondary schools to swap their clothes and which is particularly important for young people who are changing their sense of style as they're sort of experimenting with their sense of fashion um but also uh, we grow very quickly and as soon as you've bought a t-shirt you're growing out of it the following month um, and so having to keep up with that pace of throwing stuff away even though it's really still viable clothing um, is something that I wanted to kind of challenge and the easiest way I could think of was that if we just set up in school swaps it would mean that older students could hand in their clothes that younger students would then be able to take uh, home and will be able to wear um, and then you just kind of keep the cycle going on and it allows that flexibility for um, experimenting with style but also making sure you've got clothes in your wardrobe that fit you and are fashionable um, and so that's kind of what we were originally doing um, and the way it would work was with the token exchange so you would bring in your clothes um, and you would get tokens in exchange for them. So a t-shirt would be worth perhaps two tokens versus a coat that would be worth more like 10 tokens. Um, and then the following week, you would go into sort of the classroom and you'd have all the clothes laid out and you'd pick up the ones you like, you could go into the bathroom, try them on, and then you, the ones that you want to buy per se, you would then exchange your tokens for the clothes that you want. Um, so that's how it was all going and we were, signed up to be in 10 schools just before lockdown was announced um, and so that kind of put a halt on things but it did spark what's kind of our phase two of what we're doing now which is that we've got a creators program which is all about embracing um, young people and encouraging young people to have a voice within sort of the sustainability field and around environmentalism especially encouraging young people to get involved where it can seem quite perfectionist and it's like you have to hit all of these marks to be considered an environmentalist when really a lot of people just want to get started and don't want to be criticized for it so it's a great sort of community space for young people to be able to get involved in that and not only learn things but also to be able to pass on the knowledge that they learn to other young people through our social media platforms which they have access to and the idea of the creators program is to create just so just a plethora of different things so there's poems that people can make there are like pieces of fashion that they can upcycle they can be making videos or just infographics that they're creating for sort of our instagram and all of these things will just be pushed out on whether it's our website our instagram our t twitter um and so that's kind of what we've been encouraging young people to kind of amplify their voice and we very much have it focused around the impact of fast fashion um but also being able to include other environmental sort of stories but because of such a different way of using different kinds of creativity. It allows anyone with any sort of background, whether they prefer writing or being more like artistically creative, then they can get involved in whichever way they want to. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Sakia. A um, couple of questions for you then. Um, so in terms of particularly in the you know original phase or phase one of Swap It Up, was there any, um, was environmentalism the, the strongest motivation for everyone getting involved or was it other things that, such as, you know, the skills that they develop or, you know, wanting to connect with other people in school? What's, what was the main reason for them getting involved? Uh, the main two reasons I think that people were getting involved is that they wanted to do something for the environment. So it just was something that they could tangibly get involved with quite easily without necessarily having to join like a campaign group as such um and it was only sort of every couple of weeks at school so that was quite a nice or every term at school um so it was quite a nice way of people were getting involved and doing something for the environment feeling good about doing something for the environment without having this huge pressure as well but i think the other upside to it that I've heard a lot of was that people just really enjoyed going and finding pieces because there were no two pieces that were the same and it was just the same sort of joy that you'd have from going to a charity shop of finding something that's unique um, and being able to get quite a bargain for the clothes that you have is for you to um sorry for you to also I've lost my train of thought I'm sorry <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so it was this thing that in charity shops when you're older, that's something you can really get involved in. And that's something that I've found increasingly exciting, but that's not so much accessible to sort of 13, 14, 15 year olds um, due to sort of size and lack of that size of clothing in uh, charity shops. Um, and then for it to be in school, it means that that's kind of the availability of clothes is in with that age range. That makes a lot of sense. And the other question for you is, did they come across any challenges in terms of stigma, in terms of, you know, second secondhand clothes? And obviously there, there's, you know, those perception issues that are, are the challenge when it comes to, to pre-love. We definitely did have some backlash right at the beginning. Um, people sort of saying that, it, yeah, I don't really want to say what people were saying at first, but recently, like the last few um the last year and a half really people have gotten really positive mindsets about it and uh, it's become much more of a mainstream in the media that secondhand is great but actually i think the best word to use is pre-loved like you were saying because um it just has such more positive connotation to it than secondhand um and secondhand can remind you of hand-me-downs from your siblings which isn't always the best experience whereas having pre-loved clothes from something that you can choose and be able to experiment with your style from just having the choice at school um, just allows you to feel more comfortable with it. And I think the idea of having it from uh, siblings or cousins is that um, you didn't have as much choice, whereas this way you do have that choice. And I think that's something that and we also obviously make sure that everything is washed and it's properly sanitized. And we tell people to bring it in wash and we tell people also wash it when you get home because you can never be too um, safe about these sort of things um, so and when we're hoping to go back as well um, after Covid and once it's a bit more doable in schools again is that we're hoping to take it more digital so it would be more like you kind of pre-order it on an app per se and then um, you can go into school and you can collect it and that would reduce sort of contact between students and also it we will create sort of a sanitary period of time that uh, the clothes will have to kind of sit for between going from one person to the next. I'm with you. Fantastic. Thank you, Zakia. Um, so right then, we've had I've got the questions coming in thick and fast, but I'm going to give our panelists a break for just a moment. And I'm going to throw a question over to all of you listening in. Um, so uh, Sweater, can we put the first poll question up, please? Here we go. So poll question is up live on your screen now. So what is the biggest change we need to make when it comes to uh, encouraging the public to really embrace reuse and repair? So I've got four examples there for you to, to pick from. There's other suggestions as well. So feel, feel free to put those in the chat box. We'll have a chat about those in just a minute. So these are certainly not exhaustive. You can only pick one. So you can't go and pick all of them because that's just cheating. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't stimulate the conversation. So um, the four that we've got on there is about perception. Is it about quality and safety? You know, some of the things that Elaine was talking about there, that reassurance that, you know, if you buy, like, you know, a pre-loved, pre-used 
electronic product that you know it's going to be safer to use at home it's that perception obviously what we just talked about with Sakia, that affordability and price um the accessibility you know versus online and high street retail the sort of things that andrew and refresh are trying to break down so it's that that user experience um are there other things i'm sure or we could probably spend a whole hour just talking about all the other things around it but that's our our starter before so Let's have a see what everyone, I'm just gonna give you a little countdown to see what you've all thought. So I'm gonna give you a, a five, four, a three, two, and a one. So let's go and close that poll. Um, let's see what comes up. So uh, top of the list was perceptions around quality and safety. So Elaine, I'm gonna to come to you first for your thoughts. Obviously this is a big thing on your radar. So that, uh, was there any surprise for you that perceptions top of that, top of that list? No, not really. I mean, any of them could have been top of, top of the list um, because they're all important in the messaging. But in terms of safety, um, that has been important for us. We're a retail shop um, and um, to instill the confidence in the retailer and make it a real retail experience. You know, they, they don't feel that second hand is second best and it's somehow, you know, a bit embarrassing to come in the door and buy something, you know, from, from us. Um, we are in Scotland a Revolve accredited um, organisation. Uh, Revolve is uh, an accredited uh, system run by Zero Waste Scotland for uh, charities and social enterprises in the re uh, reuse and repair sort of sector. And that really um, is there to make sure that we've got great robust systems in place for things like quarantining and um, displaying and um, safety. Um, but also it's there to just give that customer that absolute reassurance that it's the very best way that we can um, take in pre-loved items and refurbish them. Um, so uh, any shop uh, on the high street that has that revolve accreditation in their window is something that just shows people it's safe, it's quality, that they shouldn't be afraid to walk in the door because it's as good a retail experience as you're going to get as if you were to walk into any um, mainstream uh, retail outlet. So yeah, I'm not surprised about that, but we already recognise how we can try and overcome that fear about safety. Fantastic. And I think there's especially the the Amazon word is coming up quite a bit in the chat as well. People say we need to get over the, you know, click and collect, you know, the click and it appears 24 hours later from Amazon. Um, educating well, you can the do that with the remakery. If you go onto our online shop and you click for something, chances are it will be delivered the next day or close to. So it's not the, the domain of Amazon. And uh, yeah. <laughs> There we go. Perfect answer. Love it, Elaine. Love it. Um, other things that come up, things like time, which is a really good point from uh, Julia Roebuck, is time. Time to do it yourself or time to find a repairer to reach out to them. That's a really good point in our busy lives. Time is a definitely big one. And there's another one I saw in here. Get away from the cheap, wear it once and throw it away. Available fashion from like Primark. I won't say it too loud. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Andrew, were any of those results a surprise for you? Any anything on there that you would add in? No, I guess I think yeah. The second ha there is always that that barrier is quality. What's what's it like? Um, yeah, and I totally get it. It was, and and we we have that as well, right? Especially when you're online and you can't feel it and you can't touch it and you can't pick it up. It's it's definitely a barrier and. Um, when, when you're selling something that's second hand. So how do you break that barrier down? And so that's what we try to do. We, we offer free returns. So you can uh, try us risk-free, you know, like, and, but we're confident that once you've tried us, you're going to try us again. So for, for us, it's a, it's a cost. It's, you know, something that kind of affects the bottom line. However, we see it as a um, customer acquisition um, tool. Do you know what I mean? Because Otherwise, that person probably wouldn't buy from us if they didn't know that they could return it for free. And yeah, we and we do have a high benchmark for quality. So we will uh, probably higher than a high street store just for those very facts that we don't want it to get it returned. However, if you're in the store and you can feel it and touch it, and et cetera, et cetera, you can kind of assess its quality. So we've got a we've got to set set our quality standards and be, and be known for it. So yeah, we kind of, tri we triple check all our clothes. That person that brings it in, who sorts it to begin with, then it goes into photography. There's a big bright light on it. So you can see quality issues there. And then when we, when we pack it for sale, that's the last kind of port of call for, 
um, quality checks. So yeah, quality is super important for us. Well, thanks, Andrew. And I think the one, one of the other comments that's come through is around government policy. Um, and obviously there's, there's you know, a whole variety of things that are coming through, particularly the UK government at the moment are putting through, uh, just about to come out to consultation for a whole range of uh, different policy measures, including things like uh, extended producer responsibility. I know, Zakia, you've been really vocal about this and some of the things that you've been talking about around textiles. You know, what, what part do you think um, things like extended producer responsibility have to play in this space? Yeah, I mean, I spoke about extended producer responsibility um, with, in an interview with the BBC around um, plastic uh, packaging and how that's something that the government's focusing on and how that's probably going to uh, creep into fashion in the sense that the packaging on fashion items is probably going to steer away from being plastic packaging. Um, however, that is not enough. There needs to kind of be this extended producer responsibility of how garments are made and making sure that they're made to last. Um, and then also to make sure that there's a plan for the end of wearing by, by one person is that what, what happens next and the responsibility of the producer as to what happens after the person who's bought it no longer has a use for it, whether it's because they've grown out of it or because their style has changed. Um, and then also the idea of going back to the idea of it shouldn't be because it's no longer wearable in the sense of it has uh, torn or it's not made to last. That's part of the responsibility of the producers to make sure that the quality of the clothing is made to last. Um, and so I think that's kind of the next step of the government's plan of producer res extended responsibility is that, particularly within fast fashion. I'm on mute. There we go. That doesn't help, does it? Um, Elaine, I see you nodding. Are you any any thoughts around around policy in this space as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, manufacturers that have talked about electronic waste laptops, computers, and things have to think about well, what's going to happen to this uh, item. So it should be, you know, the right to repair. So it shouldn't be that we're creating things that are just an absolute nightmare to get into. Um, it shouldn't be that it's you need, uh, you know to be the brains of Britain to be able to understand how to fix it. So there should be that sort of, um, you know, if we need a special tool, make sure that we can get that special tool, you know, um, to get into the, to the guts of things. Um, and also, you know, it's about um, manufacturing, remanufacturing. So when they're designing those things right at the very beginning, if it's not going to end up always being a laptop, that they've got the component parts that we can easily get hold of, we can make it into something else um, and, and be really in inventive. You know, this is the opportunity for these manufacturers to be really inventive. Uh, but for as long as we make it that repairing it is prohibitive, it's, it's too expensive, it's too complicated, then you're always going to fight this, press the buy new button. So we've got to get round all of us together, the manufacturers and, and the consumers, about it's actually easier, preferable, or enjoyable to know how to repair and reuse the item. Fantastic. Thank you, Elaine. Um, so I think it's probably a good time to go into our second poll question because somehow it's already we're already 34 minutes in. Um, so Swetha, can you pop up the second poll question, please? So everyone get ready. Um, fingers on buttons. Oh, I've always wanted to say that. Um, who has the biggest role? And I think it's another one of those where you could probably click all these boxes because everyone has a part to play. But if we have to pick one person that really has to you know, take the first step, really uh, lead the charge when it comes to reuse and repair, who is it? Is it citizens? Is it the education sector? Is it the national curriculum? Is it the third sector? Is it social SME sector? Obviously, there's two slightly different ones popped together then. I was just trying to condense the number of options that you've got. Is it the business sector? Is it local government? Is it central government? Who's got the biggest role to play? And if there is others that I've missed and actually you think they're the most important, again, put it in the chat. I'd love to see what you think about that as well. So I'm going to give you a little countdown again. Um, I could do with like some sort of like nice backing music, so that's maybe for next time, like a little countdown. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> so let's go. Uh, we're going to give you a five, four, three, two, and one. Let's see what results, what you all thought. So, ah, big leading the way, probably following on from our previous um, 
question was around central government, 38% of you, and not far behind are citizens leading the change. And I guess, with, especially as we're adopting the models that you're all working, you know, Andrew at Refashion, you know, you guys obviously are completely led by that consumer change. Are you seeing more people interact as we're getting that heightened awareness around you know, the environment and the impact of fashion on the environment throughout the supply chain? Are you, are you seeing more people come to you as we're seeing that citizen change, that citizen swell of yeah, I think so. I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty new, so you don't know whether it's just because we're new or whether it is a groundswell of public opinion. But, you know, like I just know that it, the pre-loved market is, I think, due to be growing five times quicker than existing fashion market, and it's predicted to overtake it in the middle of this decade. It, you know, like it's... Um, you know, like, so, and that's by an American company that's kind of leading the way out. It's called Thread Up in America, which is huge. And they're kind of like, just not, you know, they, they've, they're kind of like the poster child for a lot of um, uh, pre-loved fashion, fashion sites. So they, they do a report and they're predicting it to be, and, and, and that's all led by consumers. It's never, it's not led by governments. So, I mean, governments, I think, could put in check some of the rapacious um, behavior of retail, you know, like of um, brands that, you know, from nose to tail are pretty unethical. Um, and so, yeah, I think they could put the, those sort of things in check, but that doesn't change consumer behavior. And it is all about consumer behavior that will ch change this. And, you know, like it, I think it, and I don't know about electronics and things like that, maybe it is, but you get a sense that it becomes a badge of honor. It becomes something that you're proud of. It's not like, you know, like the perceptions of secondhand had, you know, like a heavier consequence probably in my, when I was younger, but like this whole new generation. I mean, uh, I think, I think they don't, they don't care so much as long as it's aligned with their values. They'll, they, they think it's actually, it's, it's better to be behaving like that and, and shopping like that. That's a really interesting point. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, something that's coming in time and time again, actually, has been mentioned a lot, it's around cost and it's around value. So I think the, I think probably the best way to phrase this question is to try and encompass everyone's thoughts is if consumers had to pay the true cost of their original, original products, particularly buying new, do we think that's a real unlocker for them to really change their habits if suddenly the, they're paying the actual true cost of those, um, those products being uh, produced in the first place? And would that drive more thinking to you know, more affordability uh, around reuse and repair. I'm going to start with Elaine, I'm going to come to you first on that one. And I might come to each of you, so just give you all a heads up. It's coming your way. Undoubtedly, <laughs> you know, anything with repair and reuse, you've got to make it simple. You've got to make it accessible. You've got to explain things to people. And cost is a part of it. That's why the Edinburgh Remakery exists, because they can't afford, people can't afford to perhaps um, buy things. They need to learn the skills so that they can be more sustainable. So, but also there is a cost um, to repairing things. Um, and you know, it costs them but a remakery to teach people repair skills, to have IT technicians, to pay them to be able to repair. There's a cost in everything. Um, and, you know, some people's driver for being more sustainable is probably, and especially businesses, is sometimes it's the bottom line. It's the bottom line that drives them to it. If it's cheaper to, to, to do it X way, they'll, they'll do it. So we've got to make it that sustainable, being sustainable is is the smart move and for businesses it absolutely is a cost saver and they just need to realize it the consumer can see the value of the the pre-loved items you know they, they know they're getting value for money they, they could buy that brand new and it would cost x but they've got something that's absolutely the same quality absolutely perfect but a fraction of the cost so it actually makes sense so i think that we've just got to get away about we shouldn't be embarrassed to bring cost into being sustainable it, it, the two things are are uh, as important and they're drivers as well um so i don't think we should get worried about um mentioning cost when we talk about repair and reuse thanks elaine that was that was a really interesting answer um andrew anything else you want to add to that from from your perspective yeah, I suppose, yeah, the cost uh, would definitely be a barrier if you factored in uh, these kind of penalties that brands would have to have to pay, you know, but it becomes a bit of a 
Well, you know, like the, the other thing is that it is amazing, though, that you can, uh, you know, would you then be punishing the uh, less fortunate that, you know, in a way, sometimes the fact that clothes are probably cheaper than they've ever been, um, they means that they can afford um, clothes. So it's a kind of an education thing, I suppose, you know, because suddenly if you have to buy um, everything brand new and it's triple the price and there aren't the outlets like refashion and all these you know like that and it is limited do you know what I mean it would have to it, you could end up punishing people that um you know like are in need of it most so um yeah but yeah definitely costs would would fundamentally change consumer behavior without a doubt mm. fab and um, Sakia what, what's your thoughts on cost related to uh, yeah, I, I completely agree so costs will ultimately affect so if you put factor in the cost of um all the different things not just the production costs but also the cost it will have on the planet um and also the social costs as well that it is going to make items more expensive ultimately and so people are going to want to look after them more and going to want to repair them more. So if you've only paid five pounds for something, you're probably not going to want to pay an additional five pounds to go get it repaired if you don't necessarily have the skills yourself to repair it. Um, and it goes back to this thing of like time to repair it. So you might ask someone else to repair it. Um, but if something costs more in the first place, you're gonna have the investment of paying to get it repaired. Um, but then as well as, that there's the other side which Andrew brought up but that if you aren't able to afford um items that cost more then you're at that disadvantage and it's not your fault for perhaps um only being able to buy into fast fashion because that is what you're able to afford at that point um and so I remember this sort of uh story about a man who can only afford shoes that cost like five pounds but they wear so quickly that over 10 years or something he's spent 500 pounds on shoes compared to another man who spends 50 pounds on a pair of shoes that last the 10 years so he's only spent 50 pounds so it's 10 times less than the other person but because of that immediate amount of money that you have available um it just skews things so differently and so it's something that definitely needs to be factored in is how much money people have available in the immediate versus the long term and how that's going to kind of affect things so it is very much so in order to be sustainable you have to be economically sustainable environmentally sustainable and socially sustainable and so we have to factor in all of those things to make sure we're truly sustainable. Very true. That, that's, that, that's a quote of the webinar, I think. That's very true. Thank you, Sakia. Um, fab, time is running on. So let's go with the last question um, of our poll questions. So uh, Sweater, would you do the honours, please? Poll number three. Are you ready, everyone? Get those uh, mouse fingers ready. Here we go. So. Um, this is obviously looking to the future. We're looking at all the, the different interventions that will come along to really progressing this agenda, but how we know we've succeeded. And I think this is one that we could probably have a whole other webinar on is actually what does success look like? And again, this is picking one, picking one of those different other, uh, one of the different suggestions, and obviously putting any, any other ideas you have in the chat box. Um, but this again is to go, what, what does good look like? What, how do we know when, you know, reuse and repair really has become part of the norm? Is it where we have a brand, you know, we have the, the re international remakery brand that is now more valuable than, you know, major, you know, your Apples and your, uh, and your Microsofts? Is it that, you know, reuse and repair organisations, you know, their revenues are higher than uh, the new goods brands? Is it media content? Is it that, you know, we see these become normal parts of the conversation out there? Is it that we see a reduced need for collection and disposal? because you know, tonnages and weights go down so much and actually you know, more is becoming part of that circular system. So it doesn't need to be lifted and moved somewhere else. Or is it something completely different? And again, answers in the chat box, please. You guys have been great at stimulating the conversation around this through the chat. So thoughts in there as well. This is one of those things that is, you know, we could probably have a whole webinar on it, like I said, but what, what does good look like? So panelists, I'm probably gonna come to each of you on this one as well. So. Uh, be prepared. Uh, I'm going to give you a countdown, which is five, four, three, two, and one. 
And uh, what do the results like? So, look like Sveta, let's have a look. So leading the way, I can, you can tell this is, uh, does, we have a lot of waste people on the call, can't we? Reduce need for collection and disposal services. I probably could have guessed that one. <laughs> So that's our top, top selection at 38%. Yeah, probably quite a, 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 an interesting indication. Um, but a real split between the other three, you know, in terms of, you know, how reuse and repair is, you know, in terms of revenues and media content and part of the dialogue. So, yeah, some really interesting suggestions. And that, what have we got coming in on other? A reuse organisation in every town. There you go, Elaine, that's your uh, <laughs> the next step in the remakery growth model. Uh, when reuse and repair is no longer considered new, absolutely. Uh, what is yeah is considered new um well so we've got reuse organization every town there's a there's a lot of support for reuse organization every town when the cost of repair is less than buying new absolutely i think that's a great suggestion um so coming to our panelists so andrew i'm going to come to you first what what's your what's your thoughts which one which one of those would you have picked when reuse and repair is like a major brand like apple that would be definitely like yeah i'd love that but um <laughs> <laughs> maybe not, not for uh, the next five years maybe but um yeah i think it's interesting isn't it that the uh reduced need for disposal services it's yeah i mean that is the the bellwether for it i suppose isn't it because that's ultimately what is where it ends up isn't it and so if that's being reduced and that and there's less need for it then obviously the behavior has started to change and um you know like it, it all, the, all the good stuff is happening i think the other thing that is probably a really important factor in here is well is the kind of education isn't it it's like which drives consumer behavior but it's kind of awareness and education and um the fact that it, you know, particularly with repair, right? It's a, there's skills that are involved that we never have. We, you know, a generation has missed out on, and so that becomes this barrier, right? And so I think that would be the other thing. You know, like if you could kind of get the uh, people ed educated and skilled in these things, it would probably help a lot of the uh, outcomes. Very true. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Takia, what about from your point of view? Which which one would you have picked? I went with media specifically for the reason of I have a feeling a lot of people on the call today will when they kind of look on their phone and computer and stuff they will get a lot of things advertised to them about how to be sustainable and um, a, when you're going through sort of if you're on Instagram then a lot of your feed will be to do with sort of sustainability and the environment and climate change however what I've come to realize is that Although that's something that I've experienced, my friends and other peers that I've got will have completely different things showing up on their screens. And that's because of how like cookies works and um, other sort of things you use within media, which is to present to you things that you're interested in. So I'm interested in the environment. So my phone is just like, here's stuff to do with the environment. And so I was like, oh, this is great. It's all over the media. People are knowing about this. This is like fantastic. And then I came to realize that this wasn't what everyone's uh, sort of discovery pages on Instagram looked like. And therefore it's not necessarily the way that media is changing. It's just how media for me personally has changed and how I imagine quite a few people on this call will have had, had seen their media sort of change. Um, and so I think we still need to see a bigger shift for media in general to present more things to uh, the environment and not necessarily having a big song and dance about it being to do with the environment, but just like subtleties, just kind of going that, you know, it's fine for me to be wearing the same dress in two photos in a row and just things like that, where it's just like, it's not force fed to you. It's just these sort of subtleties where it just becomes normalized. Um, and so I think that's kind of a shift that we need to see change. Um, but I think quite a few people might have thought it's already made that change, but uh, I don't think it necessarily has because it hasn't changed for everyone. Very true. I don't know exactly what you mean. So here, my, my Instagram feed is constantly telling me about sustainable products, which and then get frustrated because then you you pick them apart because they're definitely not sustainable. It's uh, full of a bit of greenwash, which is a topic for another day. Um, Elaine, what's your thoughts? Which one would you have gone for? 
Well, excluding the obvious of an Edinburgh remakery on every high street uh, across the land, which is just a given, isn't it? Um, I, I, I go back to what I said uh, in my sort of initial introduction. I think that education is, is the key to this. Um, you know, legislation and governments and everyone will drive legislation down, fair enough, and businesses will end up thinking it's going to be more cost effective. But I really see, um, you know, community led, the young people in particular, um, if, if our curriculum really talked about circular economy and brought back the and um, showed that these are uh, skills that are going to be needed for jobs of the future, jobs that don't even exist at the moment, um, that are out there, that are going to be needed for the circular economy, that are going to be needed for sustainability, have to start through our curriculum. And our curriculum is quite a slow grinding thing. You know, its ability to pivot is, is, is slow. So it really needs to get on board now. It needs to get that curriculum embedding circular economy right from the very beginning. And I know primary schools have got things like EcoFly, and things like that. I'm talking about really embedding this in the curriculum so that um, uh, you, you know skills that we need are, are there. They're not seen as, oh, well, if you don't like science, it's not going to be for you. It's for everybody. There's going to be jobs there um, in creative and textiles, you name it. Um, and I think that if young people start to see that this is the jobs that we're skilled for, and um, also if um, young people start demanding, well, we don't want to work for a company that hasn't got green environmental credentials then those companies are going to find it hard to get the talent that they need so they're going to have to start up in their game because the the generation of workforce that's coming through is going to drive these businesses to attract them rather than the other way around so as everything it's education isn't it and um driving driving the change Absolutely, absolutely. Couldn't agree more, Lane. Couldn't agree more. What about what about labelling? That's a question that's come up a few times actually. What role do we think labelling has to play in some of this? Um, you know, it, whether it's new or whether it's from a, uh, a repair perspective, where, where does labels come into? You know, Andrew, you must get you must have labels coming out your ears uh, at refashion. <laughs> what, what does labelling, you know, both from in terms of new and pre-loved, what role does it have to play from your point of view? Yeah, I guess. Um... Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good, I don't know about pre-love because I suppose we, you know, you're pretty um, explicit that you're coming into pre-love work, so you know you're buying something secondhand, but maybe labelling is more applicable to new items where you want to know um, its provenance, the materials, the, you know, like it would be really handy, I suppose, to have some unified, um global sort of indicator for um you know like what how your garment has been constructed you know like uh, you know obviously they try and do that with food um it feels like the fashion industry could do with something like that as well which would help um steer consumers whether you would get alignment from everybody to do that would be the other um challenge you know which potentially that's what uh, governments are there there for but you know but um yeah i think you know like to help somebody make the right purchase decision at the point of um when, when, when they come to buy because there is this trend in greenwashing in fashion particularly where they'll people would just do a range and promote it and the rest of the range is completely un ethical uh, and it's a to, to trick the consumer into thinking that the brand has made changes i think you know like to have that clarity rather than a marketing comms message but it's the truth about the product would definitely help yeah very yeah I, I, I totally know where you're coming from andrew i'm conscious that we've got like literally six minutes left and then we've got to wrap up for the for uh, for today i'm sure we could go on much much longer so um uh, I will come to each of you for your final thoughts in just a moment. Um, there are a few questions that are left that are very specific for yourselves and how each of your organisations run. So Sweater, if we can share those afterwards for um, our panellists to get back to those who've answered those questions. However, there, there is a call for knowing if uh, Refashion and Swap It Up is going to be expanding overseas. Um, so I don't know if you guys have plans, uh, Zakir or Andrew at all. Um, there are calls for... for uh... <laughs> to go international yeah, well we're about to open in Ireland so um, not quite it's 
global-ish, isn't it? Just over the, but yeah, the um, for baby steps just over the water. We're going to open a, um, we're partnering with a charity in Ireland. So yeah, we're going to see how that goes. And yeah, who knows where, what, what other territories we, we might move into. Um, in terms of Swap It Up, at the moment, anyone can get involved in our creators programme. Um, and so we're kind of just inviting anyone, but at the moment we're really trying to scale it up nationally at the moment because we're still quite localised to sort of South London and we're trying to get it uh, much more broad than that. Um, and we've got creators on our creators programme from all over the UK. Um, and so when we're able to do swaps again, all of them have said that they want to take it back to their schools. Um, so we know that it's hopefully going to nationalize but then beyond that we definitely want to go international as well there's no reason why we can't um and so it's kind of like a little franchise that each school can kind of take on so the school will be able to wherever they are in the world will be able to just kind of take it on and uh sort of suit it to the way that their school works and what would work best for them so i think the first step is definitely to make sure it's a national program and then we want it to go international kind of beyond that and I've got quite a lot of friends um, across the world from campaigning that I've done um, and so those are kind of some sort of channels that I'm hoping to use in order to get it international as well. Fantastic. So we're going to have three global brands, I think, in the not too distant future, aren't we? This is this is really exciting. You heard it here first, everyone. Here we go. Um, fantastic. So to wrap up the session, I'm just going to come around to your just final thoughts, final takeaways for our audience. Um, Elaine, I'm going to come to you first. If that's okay. Uh, with regards to the topic, making reuse, normalising it, I think um, to me, reuse and repair is just a no brainer. Um, it's fun. It's social. Um, it's cost effective, um, it's community, uh, it's good for the planet, it's good for business. Um, I don't think there's anyone that's losing out here. Um, so to me, it's, it's just about getting that message that reuse is top of the waste hierarchy. It's, um, it's just going to be the default setting. And in a few years time, we'll not be sitting here talking about it. It's just, it's just going to be the way of life. That's, that's the dream. Love that. Love that. Andrew, what about your, your final thoughts for our audience? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I concur with Elaine. It would be, you know, that's the way we see it. We see it as being top of the tree and we see the future in it and we see, um, uh, and, and I think I'm absolutely positive that um, there is a shift happening. Um, potentially, perhaps we're at the, you know, the, the beginning of it and we just don't know it's a wave yet, but I'm sure it's growing. And yeah, I'm very positive and optimistic for the future that we've got, we, we've got a, We've got a way out of this um, mass consumerism that's polluting the planet, and I think I, I'm super optimistic. It's fun. It's optimistic. What a great way to end end our webinar. And it's a key. Last words from you. Um, yeah, I think we've definitely already started to see sort of change in behaviour. Um, to do with, like consumption and how we're like reusing and everything, and how young people are wanting to kind of have vintage clothes and have, wanting to have pre-loved clothes. And it is becoming more of a thing that, that is talked about over um, social media. However, it still has a long way to go and there is so many people that need to get involved. So it's governments working together and businesses working together and citizens working together and then also having the technology behind it as well. And it's not going to be dependent on just one of those factors, it's going to be rely on everyone kind of working together and being um just so collaborative in order for us to make this work and i think we need to stop pushing the blame onto people and just go right it's time to just work together now that's a perfect way to end thank you sakia um thank you to all of our panelists uh, it's been a brilliant session thanks to all of you listening in there's over 100 of you, 100 of you that have been with us um throughout pretty much all of this webinar uh, obviously there's been loads of questions coming in those that we couldn't get to answer we'll ask our panelists if they can can get back to you because some of you had some specific questions about how each of them operate and what they're up to uh, and thank you for all the chats and the comments it's been great i've been trying to keep up as best i can i know sweater's been there looking after you all as well uh, but yeah thank you so much for your input thank you again to our 
our panelists. It's been a great session. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself from a selfish point of view. And uh, Sweater, I'll pass back to you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, I think you managed to pack quite a lot of information within the hour. Thanks a lot for taking the time out to moderate this uh, excellent webinar. And thank you to the panelists as well. And uh, like Sarah mentioned, thanks a lot to the audience. You've been really engaged. And I know some of you had questions about uh, whether the webinar is going to be recorded. The webinar is recorded and those of you who have registered will have access to it. Uh, and in two weeks, we put it up on our website and you could pass on that link to anyone that you think should listen to the webinar and uh, do sign up for uh, head to our website and do sign up for our newsletter. You will have updates about future webinars and you will have access to other panels, Sarah has moderated other panels for us. Please head to the video panel section on our website and you will find them there. Thanks a lot and have a good day or good evening wherever you're uh, coming in from. Bye-bye.